two years ago, I talked about my book, The War of the World, uh, which was an explanation, I think an explanation, of mid-20th century conflict. One of the arguments that I made was that there were three things uh, that determined the timing and location of extreme organized lethal violence uh, in the mid-20th century. Uh, empires in decline, that's a subject I've uh, written about in other places, ethnic disintegration, and economic volatility. And two years ago, I was able to say we may have one and we may have two, but fortunately, we don't have three yet. At that time, I was also quite regularly speaking at meetings organized by investment banks. You remember what they were, don't you? <laughs> and uh, the theme of my talks in mid-2006 uh, and early 2007 was the possibility, indeed the probability, of a liquidity crisis striking highly leveraged financial institutions and causing the kind of financial crisis uh, that hadn't been seen in more than a generation. Uh, I wrote a number of pieces and gave a number of talks on this theme. What most impressed me was the extreme reluctance of anybody in the financial world to take this scenario seriously. At that time, two years ago, uh, the conventional wisdom on Wall Street and in the city of London was that we were living through what Ben Bernanke called the great moderation, the death of volatility. Risk had been allocated to those best able to bear it. This time, it really was different. And my approach to the problem was to say, financial history will prove you wrong. You only believe this because you're basing your assessment on your own experience. And that is too small a data set. Even if you've had 25 years on Wall Street, you cannot imagine what it might be like if a really big liquidity crisis struck. The Ascent of Money is an attempt to provide context for this crisis. It was written in anticipation uh, of the crisis. And I hope that for those of you baffled, uh, or at least somewhat disconcerted by what is happening, it will offer some illumination. Uh, it is a layperson's guide to the international financial system, written on the assumption that you can't really understand something until you know where it came from. There's only one equation in the whole book, and it's there to be ridiculed. What I want to do this morning is not to talk through uh, the argument of the book, but rather, because of the nature of this audience, to explore its geopolitical implications. What does it mean when a subprime mortgage crisis, that is to say a crisis in the mortgage market for relatively poor Americans, precipitates a credit crunch, that is to say a major breakdown in trust between financial institutions and a seizure uh, within the credit market, which in turn begets a global financial crisis comparable in its magnitude to the worst recession uh, of the post-war period, perhaps even comparable, who knows, with the Great Depression. What does that mean? Well, there are a number of arguments out there that are relevant here. My friend Fareed Zakaria is riding high in the bestseller list with a book called The Post-American World. Does this accelerate the transition to a post-American world? Many people seem to think so. This, after all, is a financial crisis made in America. One thing seems probable to me, and I'm quoting here Per Steinbrück, the German finance minister, only a month or so ago, the US will lose its status as the superpower of the global financial system. A power, here's a headline from the New York Times last month, a power that may not stay so super the United States. A shattering moment in America's fall from power. That was the Guardian. The end of hubris, der Spiegel. It is fast becoming conventional wisdom uh, in the Western media, and one also hears it argued in Asia too, I've just returned from a trip to Singapore, that this crisis implies an acceleration of the decline and fall of the American empire. Richard Holbrook, only the other day, published an article in Foreign Affairs in which he argued, 
and I quote, there is one pattern that comes very close to being a law of history. In the long run, the rise and fall of great nations is driven primarily by their economic strength. Rome, Imperial China, Venice, France, the Netherlands, Portugal, the United Kingdom all had their day and their international decline followed inexorably from their economic decline. This, of course, is the legacy of Paul Kennedy's uh, great book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, uh, a book that I very much admire but have had occasion uh, to disagree with over the years. Now, you might expect me to be attracted to this argument, particularly if you read my book Colossus, The Rise and Fall of the American Empire, the last chapter of which suggested, and this was published uh, back in 2004, that the principal vulnerability of the United States was not imperial overstretch, excessive military commitments abroad, which you'll recall was Paul Kennedy's argument in 1987, but was internal indebtedness. The fiscal uh, deficit, the current account deficit I suggested in 2004, were among the three deficits that were likely to undermine the American empire. You'll remember the other deficits were the manpower deficit, the chronic inability of Americans to export people, uh, which is a major problem if you're trying to run a global empire. And, of course, the attention deficit, uh, which has plagued all American interventions overseas with a very few exceptions. However, I'm going to argue somewhat uh, paradoxically this morning that the credit crunch, or global financial crisis, or Great Depression, whatever you feel like calling it, that this great economic shock does not necessarily reduce the power of the United States. It may, in fact, have the opposite effect for the simple reason that power is relative. 